and a very warm welcome. Thank you so much for joining us to our panel on discrimination and AI in the workplace. My name is Emma Nelson and this part is of the 2022 OECD International Conference on AI in Work, Innovation, Productivity and Skills. It's hosted in a partnership between the OECD and supported by the German Federal Ministry of Labour and Social Affairs. We are joined this week by more than 70 speakers and three and a half thousand registered participants from more than 100 countries, so thank you. For your time. The purpose of this week is to broaden and to deepen the debate on the impact that artificial intelligence or AI has on work, innovation, productivity and skills and just importantly on the policies that we need to make artificial intelligence trustworthy, effective and to everybody's benefit. For the next hour, please do feel free to pass comments, materials and questions into the chat facility that you will see on your screen. We will be collecting some of these questions to ask the panelists in the last half hour of today's session. And we very, very much want to hear from you. When you get in touch, please tell us who you are, what you do, its relevance to today's debate and your question. And we will endeavor, or I will endeavor to pose them to the panel. Um, let me briefly set some context for you though, before we hear from today's panelists, discrimination at work is nothing new. So when artificial intelligence came along, it has been seen as a chance to iron out the unequal treatment of, for example, women, people from ethnic minorities, older and younger workers. AI, it was hoped, would expand a company's talent pool and make sure that workers were based there on their competencies alone. Now, to an extent, AI can formalize rules, so you can see where the benefits coming from when it comes to the hiring and management of people, but it has created its own set of problems, which we will be discussing in a while. It struggles with bias. And in some cases, instead of removing the inherent prejudice that a company may be experiencing, it can actually reinforce it. A very, very well known situation is Amazon discovered this when an AI recruiting tool it had put in place to hire software developers downgraded women because as potential candidates they had not been part of the previous decades staffing profiles most of those had been men so that's what amazon looked for but ai by itself is not biased it can't be it's a computer program but it can reflect biases in society so human programmers who have their own biases make choices about which parameters ai systems should consider before we talk to our panelists i want to hear from you this afternoon or this morning, wherever you might be, um, to give you a little bit of a poll. I have a question for you on a scale of one to five, and please answer this in the chat box on the right hand side of your screens right now. Um, the question for you is this, and please answer immediately if you can. On a scale of one to five, do you think that current AI systems lead to more or to less discrimination in the workplace? Let me give you that again. On a scale of one to five, do you think current AI systems lead to more or to less discrimination in the workplace? Let's see if people are putting things in. As soon as I get an answer to that, I will come back to you and I'll let you know how we're getting on with it. Um, but as we were saying, any biases that AI might, may have been uh, in existence will be baked into a system, into a whole system. And then when replicated at scale and disseminated and standardized, whole patterns of reinforcement of, of disadvantage can be reinforced. Racing to keep a grip on this is the world's lawmakers. The slower pace of legislation can find itself pitted against Silicon Valley's approach of move fast and break stuff. Still, many are taking action since 2017. At least 60 countries have adopted some form of artificial intelligence policy. And in November, the New York City Council banned the sales of automated employment decision tools without annual bias audits. An OECD report is out in May, and it will examine the different approaches policymakers are taking to ensure that AI systems don't contribute to additional discrimination in the workplace. But do we need fresh legislation or are the existing laws that we have already, are they able to offer sufficient protection or remedies against bias in the workplace? 
Well, let me get straight onto our panel. Um, first of all, Professor Pauline Kim, the Daniel Noyes Kirby Professor of Law at Washington University School of Law in St. Louis. Her current research focuses on the use of big data and artificial intelligence in the workplace and the implications of these technologies for employee privacy and workplace equality. She joins us on the line from St. Louis, Missouri, where the time has just gone eight o'clock in the morning. Good morning to you, Professor Kim. Good morning. Thank, Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us. Um, an hour ahead is Commissioner Keith Sonderling. He is from the US Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, one of five presidentially appointed members that serve on the bipartisan commission, working to prevent and remedy unlawful employment discrimination and to advance equal opportunity for all in the workplace. A very good morning to you. Um, Commissioner Sunderling joins us from Washington, DC. Thank you, for, good, thank you for the time. Good morning, good morning. We head to Vienna now, where it's just gone three o'clock in the afternoon to, uh, to hear from uh, Dr. Joanna Goody, Head of Research at the European Union Agency for Fundamental Rights. Her work at the EU FRA encompasses the field of AI. And in 2019, she was chair of the EU Agency's Network on Scientific Advice and a member of the Commission's High Level Expert Group on AI. Good afternoon, TJ. Good afternoon. Good to have you. Finally, just gone 1am in Canberra, where we can now hear from Commissioner Lorraine Finlay, Australia's eighth Commissioner for Human Rights. She leads the work of the Commission in areas including business and human rights, human rights in technology and modern slavery. Good morning, Lorraine. Good morning. I'm very happy to be here. Good to have your company. So, it's going to be quite a lively debate, but let's start off with some, some, some questions. Let's talk about the challenges that AI is posing to the anti-discrimination legislation, which is already in existence. And let's look at potential ways of strengthening existing legislation, as well as new policies that, that we could be looking at. Um, Professor Kim, um, let me start with you. When we talk about bias in employment, you in the past have talked about how bias can infect hiring tools with bias. It's an incredibly strong and powerful world. So in that context, what are the challenges posed by AI to our current system of legislation and anti-discrimination legislation in, in particular? Yeah, so um, I think in some ways we have some tools to deal with this, um, but the question is really how those tools are gonna apply to these new technologies and whether they can meet, as you're suggesting, some new challenges that they raise. So I'm gonna speak from the perspective of American law, which I'm most familiar with, but I think there's similar concepts elsewhere. Um, we did have this idea of disparate treatment and disparate impact. Um, and we also have an idea, a concept of reasonable accommodation. If someone has a disability, that disability should be accommodated. Re, uh, disparate treatment addresses um, intentional forms of discrimination and then disparate impact uh, is a theory that says even if the employer doesn't intend to cause discrimination, if the policy or practice has the effect of screening out historically disadvantaged groups, it can be a form of discrimination. So I think that overall framework is quite strong. It gives us a lot of tools. But the question is, how will it be applied to these new technologies? And I think that's where there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, part of the difficulty is as employers start to use these algorithmic tools, it's not entirely apparent to the worker, to the applicant, when their application is being judged by an algorithmic tool. And if that's happening, how exactly that's happening, what data is being used, what is the analysis that, or the assessment that is being applied that might lead to somebody being screened out. And that sort of opaque nature of the decision-making process, I think makes it very challenging, particularly because in the US, we have really relied primarily on individual enforcement. And we do of course have the EEOC and I hope the commissioner <laughs> will speak to, to, to their role, but, but the vast majority of employment discrimination enforcement takes place through individual lawsuits. And if those individuals don't know that they have been screened out based on the output of an AI tool, it's going to be really hard for them uh, to try to enforce that. And you put on top of that the difficulty, the technical difficulties of an individual trying to um, have the know-how to assess one of these tools, and, and it gets very uh, complicated. So I think the reliance on an individual um, approach to enforcement um, may be somewhat limited and something we need to think about. It's an issue that um, often puts the focus on the on accountability for if or when. AI discriminates, doesn't it? So let's move on to you, um, uh, Commissioner Sanderling. Um, as 
part of the US Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, you are investigating discriminations committed by employers, unions, employment agencies, whoever is, is, is getting it wrong. Where do you think the focus should be? Or do you think that with AI, there's a need for more accountability from the vendors and the developers of, of all this that, that people are just having to manage with in, in their day to day lives? Yeah, and this is where it gets a little tricky. I do want to echo um, Professor Kim's statement. Like our our laws here um, at the EEOC, they were designed developed in the 1960s. They they may be old, but they're not outdated. I believe they apply to equal strength to the technologies employers are using uh, in 2022 and beyond as they do to human resources professionals in the 1960s and the 1970s. So to Professor Kim's point, it's, it's on us as the agency responsible for administering and enforcing these laws to apply those laws to new technology and to show how they work. And that's very much a responsibility that I take seriously. But to your point um, about who is liable here, there is without question under US law, and this is where you know, it diverges a little bit from some of the EU proposals, which I know you'll talk about, is under U.S. law, the employer is liable for the employment decision, no matter if it was made by a human or if it was made by AI. And that is critical to understand as companies go all in on HR technology, is that at the end of the day, no matter the decision, no matter if the discrimination occurs by a faulty algorithm or somebody actually making it discriminate, or if it's just like your Amazon example, where it was a, a date, one data set allows this, the employer is going to be liable. So from our perspective, where does the vendor come into play to your question? And that question in the United States is generally unknown because we're still in the infancy of this technology. We haven't seen the lawsuits. We haven't seen the investigations. So right now, um, vendors um, under our law um, who are designing these products, they may not be subject to our jurisdiction specifically outside of them being employers themselves, obviously. So the question is, from my perspective here in DC, how do we get to the vendors who are not those employers that normally are very used to complying with the EEOC, who may be more computer technicians than they are HR professionals? How do we get to them and how do we make sure they understand that the technology that they're building is still subject to our laws. And for them to be compliant with our laws, we need to speak to them in a different way than we speak to HR professionals because um, they're computer scientists building these programs. So I think that's a challenge that we need to come up with here is how do we not only, to Professor Kim's point, how do we get the workers who are being subject to this technology, the knowledge that they're being subject, that you know their employment decisions are made by a computer, but also to the vendors, how do they design and build these products in accordance with US laws from the 1960s? And again, that's very much my responsibility here. Um, thank you very, very much indeed for that, um, uh, Commissioner Sonderling. I can just bring you the result of our little flash poll. Um, I asked you on a scale of one to five, do you think current AI systems lead to more or to less discrimination in the workplace? One being less and less being, um, and five being the uh, being very very um, uh, likely to lead to discrimination. At sixty percent, that's two thirds of you say three or plus. That's a, a suggestion that there is a concern out there. And so, how we address it is obviously something that we need to be really dealing with. Um, one of the suggestions that we get is an audit that you have a workplace audit of the algorithms to check for bias. Um, let me head to you, Commissioner Finley. Um, Joe, do you think that audits should be made by, uh, should be made mandatory? Or what do you see as your challenges when it comes to legislating for requirements for such audits? Well, thank you so much. We certainly think that they would be really important at the Australian Human Rights Commission and have done an entire report on human rights and technology setting out um, not only audits and other potential mechanisms to increase accountability, but um, a whole range of other issues relating to the use of AI. The reason we think it's so important is because obviously, while you mentioned in the introduction that AI has the potential to iron out discrimination, it obviously can also embed it and exacerbate it. And the real difficulty is that it's so often unseen. It's really hard to detect, it's hard to understand. And I think when you have a situation where the businesses using these tools sometimes don't actually understand the technology that underpins it, so they take it on faith, when the individuals who are impacted by the tools often have no real awareness of the fact that they are being impacted or how they can seek redress for that. And when the regulatory authorities that are overseeing um, the application of existing laws to new technologies 
don't have the oversight because we don't have visibility of what's underpinning um, these AI tools, it becomes really difficult to actually address these issues. So we think audits are one way of doing that, but more to the point, there's a broader need for greater accountability. But as we've mentioned, there are some really big challenges in that. Um, if I can just mention three very quickly, in relation to audits specifically, um, the fact that there's really no consensus about what the minimum requirements would be, either for audits or auditors. So you need to have those professional standards really agreed upon. Um, secondly, of course, there are issues of commercial sensitivities and proprietary information that need to be dealt with. But I think the overarching difficulty in terms of accountability in this space and in terms of audits are that we're dealing with really complex technical systems that are difficult for um, lawyers often and regulators to understand. And so it's really a need to um, take that technical information and put it into a form where it can be understood so that the oversight mechanisms can be effective. Um Thank you for that. I mean, we've been talking about attempts to try to find some sort of legislation or some sort of path through what you've just said is an incredibly complex technological system. Um, let's go to Europe, because arguably, uh, Dr. Goody, this is what the, the European Commission's proposed AI Act is trying to do. It's a huge, highly technical, incredibly involved um, bill. Um, Build last year as the most ambitious, as ambitious attempt to regulate AI technologies to date, setting out a cross-sectoral regulatory approach to the use of AI systems across the European Union and the single market. I mean, the, the ambition that contained within this is, is wonderful. Um, can you tell me how it will be comparing with the existing legislation that's in place in Europe on discrimination that's, that could or could not be used against discrimination in, in AI in the workplace. Thanks very much. Well, I'm speaking about the European Union, the 27 member states of the European Union. The EU does have law in place. It's had law in place, uh, particularly since the early 2000s which deals with discrimination in different areas of life and covering different grounds. Employment is the area where it has widespread um, uh, legislation covering discrimination on particular protected grounds like sex, like age, like ethnicity, like race, like disability, the list goes on. So we already have in place EU law that does protect from discrimination in relation to the area of employment. But as, as a previous um, speaker said, the reality this was drafted a few years ago before everybody was thinking about the widespread use of AI and algorithms. One thing I would say is if we then you ask the question, what about this new Artificial Intelligence Act in the context of the EU? What does it do in comparison, say, with existing law? We not only have to look at existing law, we have to look to the extent to which people um, actually invoke their rights. So we do know that uh, from very, very large scale surveys that the Fundamental Rights Agency does with particular groups in society that are particularly prone to discrimination. I take one example, our survey on LGBTI people goes up to nearly 140,000 respondents in the EU. We also ask them about the issue of discrimination in different areas of life. People experience, whether it be LGBTI or ethnic minorities or different groups, uh, when we break down the data from our different surveys, experience discrimination in employment when looking for work and when at work, but they rarely seek redress. So we can have the best law in place, but if people don't feel able to come forward and seek redress so that something is done about it, uh, you know, the law doesn't become uh, meaningful. This, of course, becomes more complex when you've got AI. And again, other speakers have referred to that, is that you oftentimes don't know you're being discriminated against when you're looking for work and when you're at work. So there's the issues that we have in relation to existing law and then the new AI Act. The new AI Act, it's a proposal at the moment, so we don't know what final shape it's going to, to be in in terms of what it actually states. But in relation to the area of employment and employment, worker management and access to self-employment, these have been categorised under high-risk AI systems. So there are four categories of risk in this AI Act. Um, the highest uh, is prohibited areas, 
but employment comes under the high risk area. So immediately you have this recognition that this is an area of life where we really have to tackle uh, certain issues. So there are certain obligations put on uh, developers uh, of AI and those using AI that this is a high risk area where discrimination could become a real issue. So that's immediately recognized in the law. And I can go into to more detail about that as we go on. Thank you very much indeed for that, uh, Dr. Goodijo. Um, let's let's continue with you about the idea of, of you know the new legislation that you've been talking about and how we actually go and build fair AI models. Because if we set a, a fair model, then we could be you know using AI to its its best capacity. Um, I mean, how hopeful are you, Joe, in in within you know, with, within Europe, within with the EU, that the EU AI Act could do something very positive and could successfully fight discrimination in the workplace? As it currently stands in the draft, there's something quite important and quite, uh, you know, something that demands a lot of attention when it comes to non-discrimination. Because if you look at the field of data and data governments, the governance and the basic requirements of those uh, working on AI in relation to employment, it stated that certain categories of personal data, so sensitive data, again, your ethnicity, um, your religion, for example, data in that area may only be processed to the extent that it is strictly necessary to ensure bias monitoring, bias detection and bias correction. So currently in the draft, it says you can use those certain categories of sensitive data to look for bias. So to monitor it, to detect it, and to correct for it. And that's under very, very strict uh, legal parameters about when you can uh, collect and use that kind of data. So that's really taking a next step forward, saying we need to, when we're looking at AI and AI in employment, we need to say if we do collect this sensitive data, it's to look for bias and to do something about it. So that's really a significant step in this draft legislation. Not forgetting, of course, that this builds on what the European Union already has, which people around the world are quite familiar with, uh, GDPR. So the General Data Protection Regulation, which, of course, um, is in itself something that makes people very aware of the kind of data they can and cannot collect when it comes also to the issue of discrimination. Um, heading to Australia, Commissioner Finlay, I know that uh, where you are, you've had uh, a three-year national initiative into looking at all this, culminating in the Human Rights and Technology um, final report. Its recommendation was that guidelines are now needed to see how companies and governments can comply with anti-discrimination laws when, uh, when in, in, in the world of AI. Um, why is that guidance so important? Well, the first thing I should do is acknowledge my predecessor as Human Rights Commissioner, Edward Santo, because he was the person that actually really led this work. And so I get the joy of speaking to you about it, but it's all his hard work in the background that um, really led this project. But certainly recommendation 18 in that report um, is what you're referring to. And the reason for the guidance and why it's so important is really twofold. The first is there's an obvious legal imperative. So the rules and the laws that apply in the real world extend through to this new technology. And it's really important for businesses to meet those legal requirements. And also at an ethical level to put in place practices that address discrimination and ensure they're complying with minimum standards in terms of um, human rights and anti-discrimination laws. But I think the second reason that's really important to us is that businesses have told us they want this guidance because, again, they understand these complex systems and the benefits they can have, but they don't always understand the complexities of how they operate or how in practice they can actually put in place the safeguards um, and mitigation strategies that they need to actually ensure um, they don't have the negative impacts that we know they can in terms of discrimination. So in our consultations, for example, we had 291 submissions received, 725 consultation participants, and the overwhelming theme that came through was the need for user-friendly practical guidance to actually help business not only understand what the law is, but actually at a really practical level, how do they take everyday steps to make sure they're complying with it? 
Everybody seems keen, but what are the major issues here when it comes to actually issuing this guidance? Your big challenges? There are some really big challenges in issuing the guidance. Knowing that we need it is, is the first and easiest step. Um, the, biggest, the biggest challenge is really ensuring that you have guidance that is legally sound, that is um, informed by the specialist technical skills that you need to understand these systems, but that provides that information in a really user-friendly way that business can use day to day. So actually taking that technical complexity and putting it into a practical guide for business is really difficult. The second thing that we found um, tricky in terms of thinking about guidance is the fact that this is an area that's developing so quickly that you actually need guidelines that are flexible and that provide room for responsible innovation. And I think the third thing which is really challenging is the fact that there isn't a single answer that fits every single situation. So for example, we released a technical paper um, in November 2020, and it provided a toolkit of mitigation strategies, but it also made very clear that those strategies have to be tailored to the specifics of an AI system and the broader context in which it's used. So that's something that makes clear guidelines quite challenging to produce, but it also makes them even more important in terms of giving businesses the understanding that they need to operate in this field, not only in an efficient and effective way, but a way that has human rights embedded in it the entire way through. Thank you very much indeed for that, Commissioner Finlay. Um, if you are watching this and you want to ask questions and what better panel could you ask questions pose questions too, arguably. We have people all over the world who are absolutely at the heart of making new legislation and navigating our way through this. Please do just get in touch on the, on the chat on the right-hand side of your screen. Tell us who you are, what your involvement is, and what question you have directed to an individual or to the whole group. Um, let's move back to the United States now, back to Commissioner Sonderling and, and Professor Kim. Um, we've heard about what the European Union is doing. We've heard about the challenges facing um, Australia as well. Um, out of the proposals and the legislation and the initiatives that's coming out of the US, um, what do you see as the most promising prospect to make sure that AI doesn't discriminate in the workplace? Uh, that question first to you, Commissioner Sonderling. Yeah, so without this federal standard, you're starting to see in the United States, uh, state and local governments taking up this issue, and they should be commended for taking up the issue of algorithmic bias and important in employment. Uh, but they also risk creating a patchwork of conflicting state laws that might create more confusion than clarity for employers who operate on a national, and I won't even talk about an international level, but you know, it really underscores the, the need for uh, a federal action in this area. So, you know, from our perspective here in the federal government in DC, and our laws are all encompassing, they apply to every type of technology that employers are now using AI to make. So whether it's from writing a job description, to selecting resumes, to do, doing automated interviews, all the way through AI that monitors and employees and makes employment decisions um, about how they're doing at the work. You know, we need to look at that broad perspective from the federal government. States are, are taking a more singular approach. For instance, in the state of Illinois, there's the Artificial Intelligence Video Act, Maryland. The state of Maryland has a similar focus, but that just focuses on regulating the use of facial recognition services during job interviews. The most talked about one now we see out of the state of New York, which um, requires um, AI tools and employment to go under uh, bias audits, uh, every year and the employer needs to publicly publish them. But you know, even there, the bias audits are limited to race, ethnicity, and sex, and not on the basis of disability, age, sexual orientation, gender identity, all the other laws we enforce here at the EEOC. We're also seeing proposals out of Cal the state of California, here in Washington, DC, the attorney general has proposed, and a lot of those require those yearly bias audits. So you're seeing um, from our perspective, um, the various states are sort of tackling smaller individual issues, whether it's a certain technology or requiring a bias audit on certain areas of the law. Where I look at it, we have to, to look at every single part of them, but we do need to commend them for, for moving the ball forward, for identifying um, some risks like in the uh, Artificial Intelligence Video Act about using facial recognition technology, about some of the issues there. In New York, actually 
making employers do a bias audit. So I think there are bits and pieces that we can take out of them that are beneficial. The fact that it's starting a conversation, the fact that it's requiring um, employers to start doing audits, to start looking to see if these tools are disabling or even banning some sort of tools is a good thing, which I do think that the federal government can take bits and pieces of what works. Um, but at the same time, there are some criticisms of these laws. They don't define AI, they don't cover everything, and they don't actually have a legal framework on how to move forward with damages individual to those states or cities. But it's all information from the federal level um, we can take you know, as we look at this holistically. Thank you very much for that. Same question to you, Professor Kim. Um, you know, where in the United States do you see promising action being taken when it comes to legislation to make sure that AI isn't causing too much discrimination? Yeah, so I don't know that we have any great models to point to um, yet. Um, there is, as uh, the commissioner suggested, a lot of experimentation that's going on. And I think that's all for the good, that it's getting more attention and that um, state and local governments and actors within the federal government beginning to look at this issue and try to think about it. Um, it it's I'll, Maybe I'll say a bit about the New York City ordinance, which uh, passed recently, and that's gotten a lot of attention. Um, because it purports to be a little bit broader. I mean, it's limited to race, ethnicity, and, and gender, uh, but it does purport to um, regulate the use of AI and these selection tools more broadly. And I think um, one of the concerns about the New York City model is that even though um, it, it has the right impulse, which is to try to increase transparency and to encourage, or actually, I guess not encourage, require, uh, employers to uh, audit their tools um, for discrimination uh, before they use it on an, and on an annual basis. The problem is that that ordinance has really no substance in terms of defining what's involved in an audit. It says the employer has to do an audit to ensure that it's not discriminating, but it doesn't really define who does the audit, under what kinds of conditions, what kinds of information will have to be disclosed to the auditor, it's very vague about what kinds of information would be disclosed publicly. And there's no real standard there in terms of what it means to pass the audit to say that this, this tool is discriminatory or not discriminatory. And I think that's really where the challenge is, is to, um, to not just uh, create an auditing process, but one that actually has some real teeth to it. Um, I think that there, there is a risk. I understand very much from the company's point of view, there's this exciting new technology and it's very confusing and they want something easy to say, if I do this, I've complied, I can stop worrying about discrimination and move on. But I think the, the whole way in which discrimination can get embedded in these tools is very complicated. You might have a tool that looks perfectly non-discriminatory and unbiased, when you're running it on test data, but then when you apply it in the real world, it might have these unintended effects. And so it, I think it's not going to be as simple as coming up with a short checklist and then the com company can just sort of forget about it because they're done. I think there's gonna have to be a more robust sort of ongoing conversation and monitoring of the effects of these tools to ensure that they really don't um, end up inadvertently causing bias when they're put into practice. And that leads me to my next question, which is to every single member of the panelist. Um, something that came out of uh, from Commissioner Sonder Sonderling a moment ago is that we have no great models for all this. So the question does seem to come from where is the leadership going to come from this? I mean, we have the European Union taking a big initiative here, Australia as well, federal versus state in the United States. Nonetheless, we are dealing with companies which operate internationally here. So where, where do we begin? Joe, maybe I can give it to you because you know you, you have the, the AI Act, which is attempting to grapple with this for, in a formal way. Yes, I mean, the AI Act as it currently is drafted, it has a, a comprehensive list of requirements and obligations. And of course it applies across the 27 member states of the EU and also for those companies doing business within the EU. So that's why I referred also to GDPR because you know, as and when this comes into, into place, it will have huge implications be, beyond the EU. Um, there are issues that have been mentioned by different panelists in this regard, um, because if, if you have piecemeal legislation, it's 
really difficult in the field of AI and companies want legal certainty and that's already been made by uh, Professor Kim that point that they really want legal certainty and they're, they're calling out for it. And just very uh, briefly, a short anecdote, when we did research with developers and deployers of AI. So actually those uh, designing the AI systems, we interviewed them in just five EU member states, in-depth interviews. And we found out while people know about data protection and a little bit about discrimination, they really don't understand what it means in depth. So when we're talking about those points about accountability, assessment, audits, when you actually go to those who are not working in the legal uh, side of things, the human rights side of things, people need that certainty in terms of checklists uh, and what uh, they're required to submit. So at least within the AI Act in the context of the EU, you have a lot that's in there about record keeping, about technical documentation, um, and the fact also that bodies supervising EU law can access that documentation uh, for high risk areas like employment. So it can be the case in relation to data protection and other um, uh, bodies supervising EU law, they can have the ability, according to the current draft, to go in and see what is being collected and can we scrutinize that. And it goes beyond the grounds that have been mentioned in the context of the states. It really covers uh, the AI Act as it currently stands, a broad swathe of protected grounds uh, too. And we haven't even mentioned proxies, uh, which I'll just leave that hanging in the air there. You can bring proxies in later if you want, if we have absolutely time. And let, let's let's move back to the United States to you, Commissioner Soderling, and the idea of um, leadership and the complicated nature as well, not just of the geography and, uh, and, and keeping things local and keeping things national, but politics as well. You were appointed by one president who is not the current president, and it makes you wonder that political divisions could end up leading us all to incomplete, divided approaches and, and essentially a fudge. What would be your response to that? Well, on this issue, you know, this this is, in my opinion, just like all civil rights, this is a, this is a, a bipartisan issue, and this is an issue that um, you know both sides of the aisles. So we have very strong civil rights protections in and out of the workplace in the United States, and then what, that's why we have an agency here that is made up of members of uh, different parties to um, in, in administer and, and enforce. Uh, these laws. So I do think there is significant bipartisan interest, not just here at, on the executive branch side, but also in the federal branch side. And we've seen proposals and uh, Algorithm Accountability Act um, in, in Congress. You've seen um, from the prior president and the current president move forward with uh, artificial intelligence as a national priority. You've seen uh, both in the, in the House and Senate move forward with funding to make sure the next generation here in the, in the United States has the proper tools to be able to create um, AI in accordance with our civil rights. If you look at these executive orders and you look to how some of this funding is tied, it's about developing AI within our civil rights. So I do think it's a bipartisan issue. However, to your point, it's no secret that a lot there is a lot of gridlock in Washington, DC, and very rarely um, do actually um, bills get passed and laws get passed. So in the meantime, absent you know any sort of global federal strategy, it's really on these individual agencies, like the EEOC, like the Federal Trade Commission, or other agencies um, that have to deal with how AI is being applied in their area, whether it's the Food and Drug Administration. There's just so many different ways that AI is, is touching various um, uh, industries. And I know we're focused on labor and employment, and, and that's my uh, agency. And, and again, it's, it's very much on us to be able to use our existing tools and that maybe that's a mix of both putting out guidance. And then also we're a civil law enforcement agency. You know, we have hundreds and hundreds of investigators and we have hundreds and hundreds of lawyers out there who bring cases in our federal court. So, you know, but I, but I believe before we get there, we have to put out that guidance. We have to show how these technologies flow through these laws from the 1960s and our guidance from there. Um, and then for those who don't comply, those who, who use these um, tools to intentionally discriminate, which we've seen examples of uh, in the age discrimination context, removing people or of certain ages from the application pool, then 
um, you know, that's where we need to use very strong enforcement, which we have. But I do believe that there is strong bipartisan support in Washington, D.C. Um, for uh, fair AI uh, regulation and, and guidance as well. Thank you very much indeed for that. Um, let's move on to some questions from uh, the audience. Thank you so much. They're coming thick and fast. I'm looking at them as they're coming in. And they're quite specific. One is targeted uh, to Commissioner Finley. Um, is a possible relegation to irrelevant tasks of older workers who aren't upskilled discrimination? We are looking at a world, especially since COVID, aren't we, um, Lorraine, that lots of people found themselves no longer socially or economically relevant. Is that discrimination? Well, in Australia, it absolutely is. We have an Age Discrimination Act and we have an Age Discrimination Commissioner. And certainly there's been a lot of research done in Australia about the increasing problem of discrimination against older workers who we all know can make such a significant contribution to the workforce um, in terms of particularly the experience that they bring. So um, I I'm not, um, I won't speak for other countries, but certainly within Australia, there is specific legislation dealing with that. And it's something that, again, in relation to AI, um, is something to be aware of in terms of the way that AI informed decision making can work. Um, maybe, uh, Professor Kim, you'd like to step in to try and give a view from other places where, where whether this question might be um, relevant. Sure, I think it's a really important question. Um, under sort of the way we define discrimination in the US, um, it would not be considered discrimination unless it was uh, targeted at workers 40 and older, and then it would fall under the age discrimination category. But I think it's a really important question because, um, and I think this will be dealt with later in the week in other sessions, right? But AI is having impacts all across the board in the labor and employment context. It's affecting the workplace in many, many different ways. Um, and even though we wouldn't necessarily put the label of legal discrimination on that type of a claim, it's very much a concern in terms of the, um, the impact on the workforce. And oftentimes, um, you know, workers who are, are most affected by things like automation um, will often be from more vulnerable, vulnerable populations. So even though we might not put the, the legal label of, you know, in the U.S., the title, oh, this is a Title VII case, it's absolutely a concern in terms of AI's impact on workers and the workplace and equity in the workplace. So I think it's a really important thing, even though we in this panel are narrowly focused on discrimination based on protected classes, that we sort of not lose sight of that bigger picture of how AI is interacting uh, with equity issues in the workplace. Thank you very much indeed for that, Pauline. Um, let's move back to you, Joe, in uh, in Vienna. Oh, that past question was from uh, Shaheen Sitalda, who is a production engineer. Thank you for that question. Um, Joe, in Vienna, um, a next question has, uh, has um, come through. Is one of the problems with the high risk requirements in the draft AI Act, not that it still relies on manufacturer self-assessment procedures, um, the suggestion coming here is, would a mandatory third party assessment for all high risk A applications be helpful? There is that question, isn't there? That idea that if you are a company, you might not fully either understand or grasp what needs to be done here. Well, yeah, there is that point because we're talking about self-assessment. Um, what I mentioned earlier is that um, bodies that do supervise EU law like data protection authorities, like equality bodies, which exist in EU member states, <coughs> can actually, <coughs> excuse me, go in and look at the data and can look at the documentation that was drawn up by companies uh, deploying high risk um, AI systems in the area of employment. One issue with this though, is that equality bodies which exist in EU law and data protection authorities which exist in all EU member states. They need to have uh, the required um, resources uh, in terms of the human resources to be able to understand what they're looking for. And this is particularly in the area of AI because we're looking at uh, people with the right technical skills, not only the legal skills and the number of people who can actually deal uh, with a number of cases where people are calling for redress. So in response to the question about self-assessment, yes, we need self-assessment plus, if you like. We need to make sure that whatever is there um, in allowing other bodies with 
rights obligations to be able to go in and effectively monitor the kind of data that is collected and how it's used in the AI system. So that's something that definitely um, we would say um, is something that needs to be looked at in that regard. And just to mention briefly, talking about the first question, I mean, age and all other grounds are covered under EU law in relation to employment, which applies equally offline as online. And that also includes uh, sexual orientation, disability, amongst the other grounds that were mentioned. So that would apply in the 27 member states of the EU. It currently does apply in relation to employment non-discrimination law. Thank you for that very much indeed. That question came from Jan Brabuger, who's an industrial policy advisor. So Jan, I hope that was helpful for you. I'll, I'll direct the same question, if I may, um, to Rain Finley. Um, we've talked about mandating the issue of you know, obligations to, 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 to declare or to, to, to audit. Is there not perhaps a possibility to mandate education for, for companies? Because companies are going into this as blind as blind can be. This, this technology is coming thick and fast. And your requirement to comply with it is one thing, but your requirement to know about it surely is something else. Well, absolutely. And certainly, I don't think the first step should always be to mandate. And the law isn't the only way to deal with these issues. So education is a really important component of it. I also think the one um, factor that hasn't really been mentioned is the role that government can play, not as a lawmaker, but as an example and a... Um, and in setting best practice. So for example, in Australia, we know that the government regularly uses AI informed decision making. There've been a number of examples of very high profile um, systems that have been used that have raised really significant human rights concerns. And certainly from a government level, there are really um, heightened accountability and transparency imperatives that mean governments who are talking about um, these types of principles should really practice what they preach. And a good starting point might be to make sure that government is setting the example in terms of embedding best practice in its own actions um, and then also focus on broader education and really not just imposing law from the top down, but encouraging practical compliance. Because unless you have that, the best legal framework in the world won't actually result in the changes that you want to see on the ground. Thank you for that. Uh, let's move on to another question from Melissa Sharp. Uh, this is for you, Keith. Um, it's there is a significant gap in data from poorer countries and communities. Would there have to be laws put in place to actively drive the collection of data from these communities? And how might this create an ethical gap in data rights for people coming from these communities? An added layer of complication being added here. It's for me. <laughs> it is for you, but I can okay. ask Professor Kim as well. Yeah, I mean, for 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 our our, you know, I can only look at what the EEOC can do, and we have limited ability to uh, collect data. Um, it, it's a very complicated process. The only data we collect really has been since 1966. We collect EEO one forms, which is the race ethnicity of um, of worker and gender of workers, but we have very limited data uh, uh, collection abilities. Um, outside of our investigations, which are individually corporate based. So um, not that much within my jurisdiction. Okay, that's fine. Um, so the question to you then, Pauline, um, this gap in data from poorer countries and communities, how much of a headache is this? Yeah, so I, I think I, um, I, um, that question takes me into a different place. So hopefully this is responsive. But you know, one of the, um, <clears throat> one of the tensions that underlies these developments is if we want to produce less discriminatory algorithms, one way to try to do that, particularly when the uh, bias is resulting from a lack of information about a minority community, is to try to push to get more data from that community, right? So, you know, then that's one argument, right? Um, algorithms are biased because they have unrepresentative data, so let's get more unrepresentative data. But if the uh, impact of that is to push for more intensive data collection in historically disadvantaged communities. Um, that starts to run up against some other types of concerns in terms of privacy rights and so on. Um, I think that's that tension between getting really accurate, unbiased predictions and protecting individual privacy is an important one that under, should really underlie all of these discussions. Um, in the US, we don't have particularly robust 
privacy protections for individuals, unlike elsewhere in the world. And so that makes that risk, I think, even greater that there will be, you know, in trying to solve the discrimination problem, we will end up causing harms by uh, unduly collecting personal information about vulnerable individuals. So that's a really important thing to keep in mind. Um, I think that one way to um, deal with that, at least in the employment context, would be to say maybe some kinds of data uh, when it comes to trying to uh, build an algorithm for use in the workplace context, maybe some kinds of data should just be off limits altogether, right? Um, if, if, it's, if it's data about somebody's um, non-work activity, even though, sure, you throw it in with everything else, it might be predictive, maybe that should, should be off limits completely. And so I think that that's a really important part of the conversation to add in when we're trying to prevent discrimination. We ought to also be thinking about privacy rights and where um, it makes sense to just say these sources of information, even if they maybe appear somewhat predictive, they're imposing too much of a risk on the individuals and they're really not related to, to the job and the person's ability to do the job. So we ought to take them off the table altogether. And briefly to you, Joe, possibly moving on that point, there is this, how much pressure are legislators under to um, allow a more light touch approach by companies and industry here? I mean, being told what to do is one thing, but we are living in different worlds and different uh, climates where there is an awful lot of pressure from the private sector to say, please just let us get on with our jobs. Well, I think uh, the uh, proposal for the AI Act demonstrates that it's not light touch anymore in terms of the response that we need to regulate certain areas. I just want to return to some of the points that were just made because I think also whilst we're talking about certain characteristics and they need to be protected when we talk about data and data that can also identify bias. That's why I go back to my point earlier about proxies. So companies can have a lot of proxy data that's not protected but of course, it can um, directly or indirectly uh, discriminate. So, for example, if you are monitoring in uh, a canteen at work, you don't necessarily need AI for that, but you could have AI doing that. What people's orders are for food, whether they're ordering halal food or kosher food, not only are they vegan, how many vegan meals do we need, you know, uh, et cetera. So I think we also need to recognize not only um, very sensitive protected areas of characteristics as of individuals, but everything else that can identify also your personal characteristics that AI can use and is currently using in the area of employment and going beyond that. So I think, if you say, do we need a light touch? I think we need to say, well, what do we know about what is being collected in AI systems? And is it being used to circumnavigate existing law, which works also offline as well as online? And are we actually meeting the standards that are already established to protect people's rights in terms of non-discrimination? Because if people get around the protected characteristics by going looking at proxies, that's something we need to look at too. And that doesn't mean by doing that, though, that you end up that, with something that's preventing innovation in AI, because uh, the ideal model is also you want to use an AI system that is fit for purpose uh, and not discriminating against people uh, in society. Um, let's go back. Thank you for that. Uh, great answer. Let's go back to uh, you, the audience who are watching today. Thank you so much for your questions. They've been brilliant. Um, let's have uh, another poll. Um, I asked you a little while ago about you know, your, your concerns. Let's ask you this one. Are you ready? The usual thing applies. You answer in the right hand side of your screen. When it comes to removing potential bias in an AI system, which approach should we be taking? Reinforcing, in, reinforcing enforcement of existing workforce or workplace discrimination laws or creating new legislation which is focused specifically on AI. So I'll repeat that question. What should we be focusing on? Reinforcing existing workplace discrimination laws or creating brand new legislation which is specific to AI? I'll come to you in a minute for the answers. Um, but let me go around my panel for a, a sort of a quick, a quick yes, no, if you wouldn't mind. Um, is existing employment anti 
employment anti-discrimination legislation up to the task of handling workforce AI systems. Um, where should I begin first? Commissioner Sonderman. Uh, yes, I believe our, like I said, where I started, our laws are, um, are, are old, but they're not outdated. They just need to be applied to this new technology. Okay, that's absolutely fine. So yes. Um, how about you, Joan Vienna? Well, I'm going to say yes and no. <laughs> um, uh, so that's not probably the answer you do want. But yes, they are up to a point. Uh, but that's why I gave the example of proxies as well. They might not be fit for purpose going forward also in terms of what AI can and cannot do. And also the use of AI to identify bias. Okay, so it's half yes, half no. How about you, Pauline? Kim? I'm going to do the law professor move and say, it depends. <laughs> it <laughs> depends on how the existing laws are actually implemented. The answer could be yes, or it could be no. Yes, it could be yes or could be no. This is getting worse. All right, let's head to, let's head to Canberra um, and have Commissioner Finlay's response. Certainly, um, please. I would say yes, but with some adjustments. Right. So the broad legal framework is the same. Anti-discrimination principles are important in applying the real world and to the new technology. But in order to enforce those laws, uh, workforce AI systems have to be visible and understood. So that gets us back to the original point about these laws will work if there is sufficient accountability and transparency um, embedded in the actual AI systems and the way we approach them. Okay, so we tailor what we've got. Um, let me give you the uh, results of this poll that we had. Um, the question was, which is, um, which is going to be de dealing potential bias in workplace AI systems, either reinforcing the legislation that we have uh, in existing workplace discrimination laws or creating new legislation focused speci specifically on AI. Um, you, the audience, have said that 43% say reinforce the existing workplace legislation which means that 57% of you want new legislation focused specifically on AI. Um, Commissioner Sonderly, I'm gonna ask you very briefly for a very, very one second, you know, two second response to that, because you said, yes, it's all all right as it is at the moment. It seems that people might be wanting to disagree with you there. Yeah, it's just because they haven't seen us apply it and that's on us to show them how it's there. They also haven't seen um, uh, potential enforcement there. And I think if there is a large federal um, uh, case, whether it's an investigation or it turns into a, uh, a, a litigation, um, I think they will see very clearly that our laws apply. Okay. <laughs> and right. that the laws are there, excuse me. Thank you very much indeed yeah. for that. Um, finally, waiting in the wings for, the, for almost the last hour is uh, Stefano Scaffetta, who's Director of Employment, Labour and Social Affairs at the OECD. It's lovely to have you with us today, Stefano. Uh, for the last couple of minutes of the session, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, let me say a big, big thanks uh, to our speaker, to our panelists, but actually to all the participants who have also shared their views uh, uh, to the different polls. Um, listen, it's very difficult to sort of summarize what I thought was a very rich uh, discussion. Um, a few takeaways. One is that, of course, I mean, we have heard from very different jurisdictions, and the situation, of course, varies from one country to the other. But I think there seems to be a number of common challenges. And maybe one of these is also what I heard from basically all our speakers is a sense of urgency. It's not just a question of necessarily putting in place a brand new legislation or making, sh making sure that our laws and regulations, which are out there to, to some extent fight the discrimination are actually fully applied and also made relevant also for the new world in which the artificial intelligence is used more in the workplace. Um, I think, again, we start from the good point that we do have long-standing and quite effective legislation uh, to deal with discrimination. And the question is how these are relevant or should be adapted uh, in order to take into account the specific challenge of artificial intelligence. One issue that a number of the speakers mentioned is actually the opaque nature. Uh, the way in which AI is used in the workplace might not be something that the workers are fully aware of. And to the extent to which uh, this is our system is largely based on individual enforcement, this creates, of course, an issue. So how to make sure that we have better transparency on the way in which artificial intelligence, different tools are used, seems to be an important point. Um, how to make sure that the individual can invoke their right by being aware of actually how AI is used and may affect, uh, to some extent, today, being hired in a company, being promoted, being offered training, everything. The second is indeed accountability. I think a very important point that Commissioner Soderling made 
is that no matter how, where the problem is on the uh, designer of the algorithm, on the way in which employees use, the employers are accountable for any bias in the way in which the algorithm is actually used. I think we've been arguing about the fact that audits may be a tool actually to be used, but also let's be very aware of the fact that we are dealing most of the time with a black box. So it's not obvious for lawyers to actually understand exactly how to conduct the audit and how to identify possible problems. And then I think a general point that through the conversation we went through about basically providing guidance to the employers who might not know exactly how the AI is actually operating and therefore they don't know exactly how to use it. But actually, I think education and guidance to the developers themselves who might be certainly good in terms of digital tools might, might not know exactly labor law and, and laws in general and the worker themselves who ultimately might benefit or not from the use of AI. I think we have heard a lot of the interesting examples. I think it's fair to say, Emma, that it was not a sort of a best practice that was sort of coming up. So there's a lot of learning from each other and also from the, a lot of experimentation. I think again, Commissioner Sotheny was referring to the fact that different states in the US are using or intervening to try to sort of you know, govern the way in which AI is used, but we need a holistic approach, a federal approach. And I think of course in Europe, the AI Act is a way to basically provide this overarching approach. But again, um, we have to basically reconcile what is the language of the designer of the coders and the language of those who have to make sure that actually law are fully enforced. So just one advertisement here, Emma, on the algorithm audits. Uh, there will be also sort of a, a five-side conversation with Crystal Wilson on the topic on Thursday. So if you want to know more about uh, algorithm audits, you might want to connect all of your participants. And thank you again for this conversation because uh, uh, these have been very useful information for us. We're about to finalize a report on the AI and ethics issues in the workplace. And certainly the discussion we have today is very useful also to complement the work uh, we have been doing. Uh, the report will be released uh, in a few months and of course uh, deal with the different challenges that AI is certainly bringing in, as well as of course, uh, making sure that we can benefit the most from its many opportunities. So with that, a big thanks to all our speakers, to all our participants. That was really a fascinating first day of our conference. And thank you for all the experts that were with us sharing their views and their thoughts. Over to you, Emma. Thank you, Stefano. Stefano Scarpata, Director of Employment, Labour and Social Affairs at the OECD for that. And that brings us uh, to an end of the session on discrimination and AI in the work. Place. It remains me just to thank you all for taking part. Professor Pauline Kim, uh, Daniel Noyes Kirby, Professor of Law at Washington University School of Law in St. Louis. Thank you to you. Commissioner Keith Sonderling from the US Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. Thank you. Dr. Joanna Goody, Head of Research at the European Uni Union Agency for Fundamental Rights. Thank you for your time. And Commissioner Lorraine Finley, Australia's eighth Commissioner for Human Rights. Thank you all for taking part this afternoon, this evening, this morning, wherever you are in the world. Um, our next session today will be beginning in 15 minutes. The focus will be on how timely data on AI use in education, jobs and software development can help to inform policy. So do join that if you can. Thank you as well for watching and thank you all for your questions and for taking part in both our poll and for bringing us some topics that we can discuss and hopefully some questions that we've been able to answer for you today. It just remains for me, Emma Nelson, to say goodbye. Thank you very much for watching. And this week is, uh, this all continues in the next 15 minutes. So stay tuned.